Good morning to all of the Oak Grove family. I'm glad you tuned in today. I welcome you to this wonderful first Sunday in May. A very special service here today. A special month, this month of May, because it's my birthday month. I would tell you the time and the date and my address, but I think um, maybe that would be illegal. Also, very special invitation to all of those folks out there who are not Oak Grove family people. Welcome to our service today. I'm speaking today from the book of Hosea in the Old Testament. Hosea is one of uh, 12 books that are known as minor prophet books. Not minor because of their, they're not important, but minor because of their length. Hosea happens to be 12 chapters, but Obadiah is only one chapter. But this book has very special meaning to me because more perhaps than any other book of the Old Testament, it speaks to us of New Testament values or New Testament truths. And I'll share those as we go along. The book has historical value, significance, and prophetic significance. I won't speak on those two issues because it would take too much time. But I will pull from this the story that our Lord presents to us to teach us about these important issues. I will read in Hosea chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. The word of the Lord came unto Hosea, Go marry a promiscuous woman, and have children. So Hosea obeyed the Lord and married Gomer. I won't answer your question you're wondering already. Why would the Lord tell a prophet, the preacher, to marry a harlot? I'll leave that with you and the Lord. I think as we go through the story, perhaps we will answer that question anyway. My subject today, a preacher marries a prostitute. A story of love and a story of forgiveness. When the marriage took place, it seems to us that Hosea, the prophet, brought much to this marriage. He brought hope, sincerity, honesty. But Gobam, on the other hand, she brought a checkered past, a sordid background, and many of the people of the town wondered about the marriage. No doubt when they first got married, there were some happy times, happy days. But as the time goes along, we learn that Gomer drifts back into her old life, goes back to things she used to do. But the prophet forgave her, brought her back, and had this again in the home. Then a child was born, a son. And no doubt Hosea thought, well, surely Gomer will stay now, will be happy now, and our marriage would be good. But not many days afterward, Gomer again slips into her old life, her old way of doing things. And yet again, Hosea the prophet forgives her, brings her back, and her life, the marriage begins anew. Another child was born, a daughter this time. And before long, yet another child, his name was Lomonima, I believe is the way you pronounce that. This child's name means not my child. And perhaps the meaning there was it was not Hosea's child. And the marriage continued for a while, and then all of a sudden, Hosea got up in the morning and found Goma was gone. She left her husband, she left her children, and perhaps with great expectations, she started off to a new life, a new way of doing things. But things began to go wrong after a while. She goes from man to man, and finally the man that she ended up with was the man that in those days actually owned her. And he grew tired of her after a while, and decided I need to do away with this woman. The custom of that day was to take her to the market, to put her on the auction block, to sell her. And so he did. To the marketplace they go, and Gomer stands there on the block with all the folks staring at her, and the bidding begins. 
One man says two shekels of gold I'll bid. Another said three shekels of gold I'll bid. Another said six shekels of gold I'll bid. Then all of a sudden from the shadows of the day comes a figure. It's, it's Hosea. And Hosea says, I will make a bid. And I will bid 12 shekels of gold. And I will a half barley of a half bushel of barley. And this is a story you can all already see and understand. A story of love and a story of forgiveness over and over and over. There are three things that we can learn from this story that I want to really speak to you about today. First of all, he loved her unconditionally. Secondly, he redeemed her. He brought her back. He paid the price. And thirdly, he forgave her of everything. He forgave her of all. Certainly the story already reminds you and me of a magnificent portrait of God's love and God's forgiveness for mankind. That mankind naturally includes you and me and I want to make it very personal today as we continue in the message. I want you to understand how God loves you and how God forgives you. The Bible teaches us that God loves you and me unconditionally. Romans tells us, the book of Romans, while we were yet sinners, he gave himself for us. Not when we were repenting, not when we were crying, not when we were sorry, not when we were doing our best, but when we were at our worst, when we were ugly, rebellious, profane, using his name in vain, going away from him. But yet, he loved us in that condition at our very worst. Then he redeemed us. You and me. He bought us back. He paid the price. Peter tells us not with corruptible things like silver and gold, but with his precious blood. With his precious blood, he purchased us. Perhaps you remember a song long ago, I believe it was entitled, Had It Not Been for Calvary. One of the verses goes like this. Just suppose God searched through heaven and could not find one willing to be the supreme sacrifice that was needed to buy eternal life for you and me. Just suppose there was no one that you and I would be left without forgiveness, without such heavenly love. It is terrifying in a sense. And then he forgives us of all of our sins. First John tells us the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ cleanses us from all our sins. Psalm 103 tells us as far as the east is from the west, he has cast our sins away from us, never to remember them again. How precious and how wonderful that truth is that he so loved us. The story goes about the great Martin Luther, the man who broke away from the Roman Catholic Church in 1517 and started the Protestant church as we know it today. He was a man of great prayer. He'd go out and pray and pray for hours at the time. He tells in his papers as he was writing his story that he went out to pray and pray for a long time and fell asleep. And after a while, Satan came. And he came with a large scroll. He said it to Martin Luther, read here, these are your sins. Not only your sins that you committed, but those sins that you've thought about. And Martin says he began to read and to read. And he read until he was so exhausted. And after he finished his reading, all of a sudden he said, one more page I'll read. And he turned one more page and there it said, but the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ cleanses us 
from all of our sins. Not certain ones that we think about, not those that we have not even thought about, but he forgives us of all of our sins. The magnificent experience of forgiveness. I don't think I have words to express the feeling of that and what I really want you to hear. If you have time sometime, read the Psalm 51 of the story of David. David was so, so sorry. And he writes there, he about his forgiveness, he, he, it seems he could not even find words to express that. Sort of like uh, the story of God's unconditional love. Uh, I mentioned one scripture to you, but let me remind you of another. When John, the revelator, was talking, and he, was, he learned about the love of God, perhaps he learned about it, perhaps he experienced it, but it seems in his uh, words and the way he was expressing himself, he, he almost shouted and almost with his hands raised or perhaps jumped to his feet. And this is what he said. What, what manner of love is this? What kind of love is this? That one would so love us that we would be called the children of God. Perhaps no one else understood our condition as John and David. But they tried to express from their own heart and their own mind what it meant to be loved and what it meant to be forgiven. And when I was thinking about this, I thought of what word would be would I use to describe the forgiveness of God that, that I consider so wonderful in my own experience. Uh, I, I like the word sweetness. The sweetness of, 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 of forgiveness. The tears of, of repentance. The, the sorrow of repentance, yes. But all of a sudden, you understand, you know, God has forgiven me. I no longer carry that burden. I no longer carry that trouble with me. How sweet it is. And David, when he was writing in the, in the Psalms, he, he even uh, talked about this and he seems to be saying, down into my bones, I understand God's forgiveness. I trust that you do understand God's love and God's redemptive power and the wonderful forgiveness that you and I experience. When I was a young lad, about 15 years of age, some fellows came by my house one Saturday afternoon and invited me to go off with them. They often did this and we were going to a, what we would call in those days a bonfire. We are going to the sand pit or we were going to the rock pile. We'd build a fire, we'd cook a rabbit, but we have some other things to eat, and we'd tell stories and laugh, and every now and then have a fight. So on this occasion, they picked me up, and we started off, and we stopped at a man's grocery store. Mr. Herbert Cadell happened to own that store, and they went in to get the supplies for the night. Well, I went in with them. I didn't have any money. My mama had less money than I had, so I had no way to sponsor myself. So as I was walking around in that store, I, my eyes fell upon a can of beans. And I decided, you know, I'd like to have that can of beans. So I slipped that can of beans into my shirt and walked out of the store, off to the party. And I must tell you, we had a good time. I enjoyed the beans. I enjoyed the rap. I enjoyed the pun. About 15 years of age, not thinking much about anything else. But about 15 years later, while I was in seminary, sitting in a Bible class, I remembered that can of beans. And I remembered it, and I remembered it. Whatever I did, it could not take my mind off those beans. I said to the Lord, Lord, if you will let me, if you will permit me, I'll, when I can, I'll go back to Macedonia, to that store, and I'll make this right. And I got a little relief from that, but it wasn't long after that I loaded my children along with Bell in the car. And we drove for 200 miles back to Macedonia, and I went to that store. I must tell you, I was hoping that the lady of the store, Miss Dora, was, would be in charge. But to my sorrow, there was Mr. Herbert Cadell, big, mean man. 
in my mind. At least he wasn't that way, but at least I thought that way. And I had to go to him. And I, I said to him, Mr. Herbert, many years ago when I was a boy, this is what I did. And he said to me, boy, you don't need to repent to me. You talk to your God about that. And I said, I've done that. And I wish, I wish I had in my mind, in my heart, words to express to you how joyful is not enough. How I felt after God forgave me. I knew he'd forgiven me. I knew it was all settled. But it's just something I had to do. And let me stop right here before you go too far with what I'm saying. I'm not recommending that you do this. This is just something I have to do. I understand that we can never go back and cover all of our bases and repent of everything and fix everything that we've done. I don't mean to imply that. But that's just something I had to do. And I must tell you, I can identify with John when he says, Oh, what manner of love. What manner of love. And I can identify with David when he talks about the forgiveness of God, the sweetness, the sweetness of the forgiveness of God when all of my sins are gone. And the psalmist said, they're gone, they're cast away, as far as the east is from the west, never to be remembered again. I trust that I've spoken to your heart today, and you will always understand and remember, God loves you. God redeems you, and God forgives you. Let us pray. Father in heaven, how grateful we are of these wonderful truths. The heart of the gospel, everything that you're about, how you love humanity. We didn't deserve it, but yet you so loved us. You gave your only son, that whosoever should believe shall have eternal life. We thank you for the redemption story, Lord. No one else in heaven, no one could we find but you. And you came and we thank you and we bless you. And we thank you so much that we've been forgiven. Undeserved, yes, but we've been forgiven. Forgiven and we're children of God. We thank you and we bless you. Amen.